And so I got rid of some of the earlier stuff. Um, let me, sorry, let me just switch my windows here. There's my press. All right, so first and foremost, okay, when you are thinking about requirements, um, the most important thing to do is to try to, sorry, I thought that was um, is not to figure out solutions at the outset, okay? The most important thing to do is to understand what it is the person is looking for to do, okay? That person may be yourself, right? But you know, often it's a client or it's a product owner or it's a whatever. Um, so I, uh, the other version of these slides, I had a big block here on every single slide that said, listen, okay? And the reason I say that, I'll tell you from personal experience, um, I was actually in a sales call uh, with, you know, like another consultant or two, um, and they actually told me afterwards that I need to listen better. And the reason is, is because I often can think fast enough that I can figure out what the person's going to say, like finish their, not finish their sentence, but like finish their paragraph kind of thing. However, that's a very bad idea for two reasons. One, sometimes you're wrong. So that's just straight up bad reason to do it, right? But two, it's also because sometimes it helps the person giving the requirement to better understand what they're asking for if they say it themselves, okay? so. Like I said, key word being listen, don't propose solutions, and don't let the person who's giving you a requirement propose a solution. Okay, so very technical people, for example, will give you a problem, or you know, they'll give you a requirement like, well, I need a table that has you know XYZ column. Okay, that is not a requirement. Okay, that's an implementation, that's a solution. You don't want those, you want requirements. So um a couple other things that we've learned from doing agile methods over the years, okay? And the reason agile methods are so popular now is because they seem to produce better software than non-agile methods. And there's lots of debate about which agile methods are the best. The most common ones, as we've talked about before, are Scrum and Kanban. Um, but the, the agile approach, kind of in general, irrelevant of the specific method, generally produces much better outcomes than any other method that we've discovered so far. But part of the reason is, is because you start to think about requirements in terms of user centric. Okay. That also reinforces the don't give a solution. Okay. So going back to my stupid example about needing a table with a certain amount of columns, what you want to know is what is going to get stored in that table? What does the user need to do that would result in this table? That's the requirement. Okay. So if you think about it as user centric, and if you um, try to go back to this root cause, I want to actually put the link in here, but I lost it on the other slide. Um, so that's part of the reason that we use this user story format, okay? Because it enforces some of those rules, okay? Because it's really hard to write this if you don't have the user, right? Because um, that part just gets blank. So that's why we use user story. Um, so as a persona, okay, does everyone know, anybody know what a persona is? All right, if anybody knows it, raise your hand or just say it. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, wait, are you Mark or Tony? Mark. Yes. Okay. Yes, two first names. It's very hard. <laughs> It's broader than that in the sense that um, it's it's the actual person. So a persona may have multiple user focused things that they want, but a persona is usually uh, like it's basically the idea in concept is like a user type. Okay, at it, its simplest. However, in most user experience kind of design um, techniques, I guess or methods, I don't know what you call it, but what you'll actually do is you'll actually develop a full person for the persona so that you can refer to them by name. So that you can then, instead of saying as a admin or as a, um, you know, 
uh, let's say, a data entry operator or as a claims you know, adjuster or whatever, you can actually have a full persona and then they get names, right? And so as and then you know one persona is Bill, one persona is Bob, one persona is Jane, they'll usually have a picture, et cetera, where that person is fully described. So that here you can actually use their name, right? Which really ties it back, and then you can have a lot more detail on what you mean by that persona. Um, and yeah, so and then the next thing is what is the user trying to accomplish? Okay, I want to what. Okay, like what is it they want to do? Um, and obviously grammar gets messy in here, but you know, so you fill that in with correct grammar, but with what is it they're actually trying to accomplish? So does anybody here know what a claims adjuster is? All right, I worked in finance services too long. Uh, claims adjuster is when you do insurance uh, and then somebody says, I want to file a claim about whether, you know, that somebody hit my car or something. Uh, claims adjuster is a person who says yes or no, okay? So as a claims adjuster, I want to be able to sign off on a claim, an insurance claim, okay? Um, and why is that? That's the other part you need. So that the end customer gets their money, right? Or so that in the claims adjuster example, or so that, uh, you know, we're in compliance with some law, okay? Uh, it could be a lot of different things, um, but they would be different requirements, okay? Usually. Um, all right, does that make sense so far? All right, not enough head nods. All right, my last class is really sleepy, so a couple more examples. So, and this goes back to that persona thing, right? So in this case, we're imagining that Sasha is like some persona thing. There's not usually a human named Sasha in the story. It's a made up person that you can have this, uh, you know, Elaborate sounds like a pejorative in this sense, but I don't mean it that way. I just mean like you know a detailed persona. It's not just off the cuff. Uh, so Sasha wants to be able to organize their work so they can feel more in control. Okay, so that leads to a lot of different stuff there, right? There's like you they, you don't get to an implementation necessarily. It may and may in fact a lot of times you use stories. You may need to break it up into pieces so that you have multiple user stories supporting that one, um, but the outcome is really interesting, right? Because this is not an outcome that you would necessarily think of as a programmer, right? They don't, they don't actually want to organize their work. They want to feel like they're in control, which are not necessarily the same thing. Does that make sense? So that's why you try to tease it all out. So at the end of the day, this is actually not a great user story because you should really be digging into it more to find out what does this really mean, right? But that's where you start. You kind of say, okay, we've got this. Now let's go and dig deeper and get a little bit more detail. Usually what happens is you get big ones like this at the beginning of the project. Um, and then as you kind of dig into where this part of the project is, whatever that is, right? Then you kind of go and do more interviews and dig in to get more detail on these stories. Sometimes you'll have a, a required, like a, a client or whatever, who actually gives you very detailed user stories. And often it will make sense to actually bubble them up and turn them into a broader user story and say, well, here's a broader user story that includes these 27 super detailed ones. So that you can have, again, kind of like that persona thing, so you can kind of have a better sense of what is the overall objective here, okay? Because the big one of the big things that is different about Agile methods and waterfall methods, right, is that everyone on the team is a participant in every aspect of the application, okay? So that might be requirements gathering, but it might also be testing, okay? So one of the things that we've seen a little bit of a dichotomy this semester in this class, right, is um, the project manager that you have is not actually, in a sense, part of your team, okay? Your team is the team that you have, you know, sitting around you. The project manager is a facilitator or an escalator, okay? So in other words, a project manager doesn't need to necessarily be there for every requirements gathering session or every discussion with the team or whatever, because they're not actually a part of that strong team. 
So, and I say that very loosely, right? Because people get offended when you say you're not part of the team. So I don't mean it in the negative sense. I just mean that they're, the contributors are the people who are writing code, producing documentation, producing tests, producing UX or whatever, not the people who are your escalation pipeline or whatever. Um, and that's typically one of the differentiators with an agile uh, application is like, otherwise the PM should be dedicating as much time to your project as you are, okay? So all participants who are part of the project should be dedicating roughly the same amount of time. They might be doing wildly different tasks, but they should be doing about the same amount of time. Does that make sense to everybody? Right, because everyone on the team is responsible for every aspect of the project. You may not be the best at that particular piece, but it doesn't mean you're not responsible for it, right? So if you have, you know, if you're getting a terrible UX out of your designer, then you need to try to fix that or work with them to fix it because it's still your team, right? All right. Um, and so this one, I think, is a much better example of reading story. This is much more actionable. Okay. So as a manager, I want to be able to understand my colleagues' progress so I can better report our success and failures. Okay. So, you know, as a manager, I need to be able to get some sort of like weekly update or something that says, this is what my team, you know, my, my team has done. You know, there may be sub teams or might be individuals or whatever, but then they want to get some sort of data about that so they can aggregate that to their boss. Right. Um, sometimes, uh, and where um, where this is something I might try to tease out a little bit more um, is so I can better report our success and failures to whom? Okay. So it could be their manager, but it could just as easily be to the Wall Street, right? Because you know, depending on where you are in the organization, if you're the CEO and you're making that statement, you mean to Wall Street. You don't mean to like your boss, right? You might actually make me mean the board, but basically the, the, the content that's gonna come out of this might be quite different. I actually worked on a system that uh, basically showed the progress of uh, the R&D division of Pfizer for the CEO to present to the board. As you can imagine, the content that appeared on that site was very different from a, de from a design, and the level of content and stuff like that, then the same thing would be for the like sales region manager of Pfizer at, in Germany, right? The data set's completely different and the scale of that data. Sorry, gotta find my water. All right, so the next problem that you all have experienced, I'm sure, <laughs> is that um, in order to be able to do this, right, to elicit those requirements and stuff, it often helps if you have some level of domain understanding. So does anybody know what I mean by a domain understanding? Okay, so I uh, think to math classes, problem domain. So domain is um, a way of saying like a subject area. Okay, so uh, for example, um, they, it, actually, it's not a good example. The ALS project does not actually understand it require a domain understanding of ALS. It does require a domain understanding or it would help, right, to have a domain understanding of audio technology, right? Um, so, you know, so it, sometimes it can be a little bit, actually, another good example from my personal life is um, I did a ton of work for Pfizer, okay, as a consultant. I did nearly nothing with drugs because we had primarily, my company had primarily been involved in financial services. So we just did a lot of money stuff at Pfizer because you know what Pfizer needs help with a lot of the time? How to, you know, how to hide their money. Um, but not just that, but also really interesting things like uh, when you change the price of a drug in Germany, it impacts the price of the drug in France because people can cross the border and go buy in the other country. Um, and so what they want to do is have a system that could predict what that would happen, what would happen, right? So as you can see, that's all money. It has nothing to do with drugs. So sometimes when you're looking at a project or particularly if you're looking at the client name, 
that may not equal the domain that you're actually going to be playing around with. So just kind of be aware of that. Usually you're okay, but sometimes it's not so much. Um, and so, you know, it's funny, like actually being relatively aware of current events can also be a big help, right? So, uh, you know, if you see a, a ton of data breaches happening in, you know, publicly traded companies, there's a pretty good chance that the next gig you, you're going to be offered or whatever is going to be related to security, right? So maybe it might be a good time to read up on security. So that kind of thing. Um, and then experiential learning, um, you know, that's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember the phrase, but there's like an old phrase for like when you get interested in something or whatever and you go and read the first page about it in Wikipedia. And then three hours later, you know, you're reading about, you know, my mother's old joke was Queen Anne's elephant and you don't know how you got there, right? Um, so there's some kind of going after that yourself. Uh -oh. All right, and then um, I'm going to kind of gloss over this one. Uh, we do have recordings for at least some of these lectures from earlier on, so if you want more detail. Um, but yeah, so the other thing is um, completeness, okay, on requirements. Um, it is very, very tempting, and this is actually how the waterfall method kind of started. It's very tempting to say, I'm not going to do anything until I know all the requirements, okay? Because it seems like it's a good idea, right? In fact, it doesn't work. So even if you spend X amount of time, whatever that is, some huge amount of time, gathering requirements, <clears throat> two things happen. One, you make mistakes. And two, the time period during which you're doing the requirements gathering, the requirements change, right? Because these are organizations that are evolving all the time, right? So, you know, that manager we were talking about before, maybe they got promoted, that was the CEO. So now the requirement is completely different about how you publish that data, right? So basically my, my general rule of thumb is like gather enough requirements that you can start something. And that's enough. Just go. And the faster you can kind of go and put it up in front of somebody, the faster you'll get feedback about what's wrong with it, what's missing, and how to move on. And then your requirements gathering process becomes informed by actual things that do things rather than a bunch of people sitting around in a room making up goals, right? Um, you have to, you do on the trade off on that, right? Because you do have to be careful with, well, two things. One, um, setting the client expectation that that's what you're going to do. Because sometimes what you don't want, right, is gather a little bit of requirements. You build something, you show it to them, they flip out because it's completely wrong. So you got to be careful that you set them up correctly, right? That they know what, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, the other one is there are definitely some systems, <coughs> sorry. Um, where, like it says here, like complex projects, it's mission critical, embedded systems are a great example. Um, one of the projects I worked on for Pfizer was collecting uh, issues with drugs. So basically, any time somebody has an adverse reaction to a drug, it um, and they report it to like Pfizer, uh, there is, a, I believe it's a million dollar fine for every single one of that Pfizer losers, okay? So that's a very mission critical system in the sense that it is a million dollars every time they drop a transaction on the floor. So spend a bit more time on the requirements gathering there, right? Make sure you really understand it. Go build a, a good beefy version of it. Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, what is like the general rule of thumb for the, like, the, the, the time gathering requirements or not that's not possible? There isn't one. Uh, experience. Um, like I said, the, the rule of thumb I generally use because the vast majority of software that any of you will build, right? Because the software development world is like 90, 95% building things that are like websites, right? Um, versus things that are, you know, uh, uh, adverse reaction management systems, embedded systems, kernel drivers, et cetera. Just the ratio is very low. 
So maybe this class is skewed, but in general, 90% of you will be doing some kind of software development that's probably related to web development. Um, you know, front end, back end, whatever, but it's surfaced as a web page, right? In those scenarios, my rule of thumb is start building something as fast as possible. Um, and, it, and you can have one requirement. It doesn't really matter. Get something up and moving because you'll make faster progress from there. And you get a better outcome. Um, yeah. So there's lots of good text on this. Um, in some of the books that are recommended reading, there's also some, I think there's uh, at least one article linked to in the syllabus too. Um, so if you want more detail around doing this stuff, uh, there it is. Um, but it's something that like, I could try to lecture about it, um, but it's one of those things where uh, you need, uh, experiential learning really helps uh, as well as um, kind of looking at lots and lots of examples. Um, and so we could try to do that in here, but I think it'll waste your time. Um, so uh, this is kind of going back to the user stories a bit. Um, does anybody know what the differences between functional and non-functional requirements are? It's a really weird turn of phrase. So go ahead. Uh, sort of, yeah. So, um, so functional. I mean, like your example for good, it's like this this close. So functional is like um, things that a user can do, right? And non-functional are things about the system itself. So speed is a good example. That's obviously but fast is not a good requirement, right? What you want is actual part numbers that you have to meet. But that's kind of the idea. Did you have yeah? Yeah, so it tends to be that the more complex and technical requirements tend to be non functional. Not always, but tend to be. Um, but the really obvious examples are usually like performance, um, like data retention. So, like how many years that any piece of data is going to stick around for. Um, you know, the, you know, basically stuff like that, right? Um, so, uh, it's important to, this is one of those points, the reason we make a distinction is because that is ridiculously common for a client to say, to tell you a non-functional requirement that is ill-defined and probably not valuable. So going back to the past example, and sorry if I'm picking on it, but it's kind of like, um, you will regularly have a client say, it has to be fast. And then you say, what does that mean, right? Because like, we're talking the difference sometimes between milliseconds and nanoseconds. So trust me, no human cares, right? Um, so that's one thing. The other thing can be fast when, right? So the login example, I think, is a great one because you know what happens at 9 a.m. at most distances? Everybody logs in at once. So you better have a whole bunch of extra capacity to support that login at that time. And then hopefully you'll siphon the capacity away the second the login is done, because then you're going to see much more normal use patterns. Um, you, know, you know, a related example, right? Retail tends to be really busy at Christmas time. Uh, you know, tax software tends to be really busy in April. Um, so same kind of idea. Um, all right. And then so acceptance criteria, that is re really, really important when, especially when you're talking about working with clients. It's also important when you're working like on an internal team in like inside IT or a software company or something like that, um, because you want to make sure that you uh, have some marker that you're going to meet so that whoever is providing you the work, most likely your manager, gives you a promotion, right? So what you don't want to get is being later on because you didn't meet some criteria that was ill-defined or not defined at all. So with, with clients in the consultancy, it's particularly important because often you do projects based on a certain, uh, like for the project, it will cost you $5, okay? If we don't know when you met the $5 worth of work, 
then it turns into you made five dollars, but the consultancy spent twenty dollars trying to meet the acceptance criteria that they didn't know beforehand. Does that make sense? All right. So uh, we also talked about acceptance criteria. So this is a little bit of a difficult term because um, I was talking about kind of more at the like, project level, but you also often will talk about acceptance criteria at the user story level. Um, they're related uh, and, off, and one should be the other, but they're not always connected. Uh, primarily, like actually, just to kind of add to that. Like, so especially when you're doing something like a consultancy piece of work and you're going to do project A for $5 with acceptance criteria A, B, and C, you don't actually want to tie those too tightly to the user stories because you want the user stories to be able to evolve, right? So you don't want to lock yourself into a waterfall to deliver on something that may not actually be what the client wants by the time the project is done. Does that make sense? So that's why I can get a little dicey. All right. Uh, other big problem is uh, what are called evolving requirements or scope. So in agile methods, generally speaking, uh, scope, what's referred to as scope creep, is actually a good thing in the sense that um, you, you want your requirements to evolve over time. But you need to recognize that that's what's happening. So for example, you start with three user stories, which evolve into seven user stories, and one of the first three actually gets killed as not being valuable. That doesn't mean nobody spent any time working on it. So therefore, that work was done, but the result wasn't what the users needed for whatever reason. Okay, so it could, like uh, I worked on a startup, for example. Um, has anybody ever heard of a startup pivot? You know what pivot is? What's a pivot? Yeah, do you know what it means for a startup? Um, so it, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, Mark, do you want to try it? Right, exactly. So uh, basically, usually as a result of some sort of like agile method or whatever, you kind of put something up in front of users and you start seeing them using some portion of the application way more than the rest. And so you pivot to focus the application on that thing that they actually seem to care about. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but when I was talking about Docker containers, right? That's literally exactly what they did, right? They had a cloud, uh, you know, cloud environment like EC2, uh, which they were actually was much more like Heroku, um, which they were running using containers using this software that they had developed. Uh, I don't know what it was called internally, but let's just say it was called Docker. Um, they realized how valuable Docker was, so they kind of spun it out and made it open source. Then they kept doing their business for a while. Then they realized that everyone cared about Docker and EC2 was going to eat, or Heroku or somebody was going to eat their lunch on the cloud side. So they pivoted, and now the company is called Docker, and the only thing they produce is kind of Docker-related things. Okay, They don't have a cloud service at all. I don't even know what they did with their old client. But that's that's a pretty extreme pivot. Um, maybe sometimes I'll sometimes I'll tell you uh, why one of the startups I was involved in ended up great. All the partners broke because we couldn't agree on pivot. Um, so I think I've said this to all of you as teams. Um, oh, sorry. No, this is it, it's also a huge point, but. Um, so yeah, so you know this. So this actually came from Darmesh from one of the prior instructors, of course. I don't know that there is actually a magic number here. It comes through experience, um, but like I said, my driver is usually ship it, build something, get it out the door, put it in front of users, and then see what happens. Um, and this is just what I was going to talk about before. Um, you know, uh, as as there's change. Oh, actually, I think I said this to most of you. So there's a common method in Scrum to just have a done column, 
right? And I think I've said to each of your teams individually, that's usually a bad idea. Do it done by sprint. Because what you want to be able to do is go back and look at the things that you accomplished per sprint. And excuse me, and sometimes the reason you want to look at that is those evolving requirements. So that user story that got canned, you can go back and look at the fact that that user story was three sprints of one and a half people. Okay. So therefore, it was real work that was done. It just didn't meet the goals of the actual overall project. All right. So I promised to put these up on Piazza, but I thought it would make more sense to do it here. Um, so architecture is a made up word. Um, I, I don't know where I, I don't know what my fingers are doing, but so I tended to go this way because it's architecture, right? So I for architect um, versus E for marketing or something. I don't know. So, or no, here is because it makes it the full word market. Um, this generally is considered the right spelling from my free research on the internet. I just typed it and assumed I knew which one it was. I didn't realize there were two. So, you will find more with an E than you will with an I. In fact, uh, Google Slides told me my second one there was wrong. So, um, but I wanted to show you a couple of examples. So, as I explained a little bit, a architecture is meant to be a more consumable version of your technical architecture, uh, usually driven around features or user stories, uh, so that you can indicate to generally non technical people uh, what it is you're being done. Uh, and so, this is kind of the like one end of the spectrum, like, this is the most marketing esque. Okay, there's very little technical detail here. Um, there is a little bit, right? I mean, you've got, you know, wire transmission cable, you know, IP systems, you know, uh, you know, customer relationship management. That's not a normal word, right? That's kind of software. Um, so, so it's, it's so it's got a little bit, but it's kind of that one end of that spectrum. <clears throat> um, then you have this one, which I think kind of starts going the other end of the spectrum, right? So it starts going towards architecture rather than pure marketing. Um, and so this one's got a little bit more technical depth, right? It's got, you know, these various functions that are done. It's kind of laid out in a actual, you know, uh, like technical architecture layout kind of looking thing. Um, it even mentions things like certain APIs by name. If you're not familiar with Saber, that's the backbone that's been running hotels and planes uh, since the 70s. It's also why you can't have, a, you can't rent a King hotel room versus a king hotel room that has handicapped accessibility. Those are two different things because they don't have enough space in the system to do it and nobody can replace Saber. So, uh, so yeah, this one kind of goes, like you said, a little bit more towards technical architecture. <laughs> and then this one, yeah, this one, well, still a mark center because it doesn't actually have a lot of detail about how things are happening. Um, this is kind of the other end of the spectrum. So you're getting really close to an actual architecture. Um, generally speaking, <coughs> I lean towards this one, you know, kind of the blend kind of in between. In, and this kind of diagram has been most successful for me to explain to both management types, but even other technical people, the broad gist of how a system works. So I might often, like, generally speaking, show somebody something like this talk them through it or whatever, and then show them the technical architecture if they're a technical person. So, but then I kind of wanted to show you by way of comparison, right? This is a straight up technical architecture. So you may have done this in other classes, you might have done this already. Um, you know, I think as software development kind of people, you have a tendency to just draw stuff like this when you're trying to explain something. Um, but so this is a straight up tech arc. Um, I tend to think like this is almost too much the other extreme. It's so boring that it's hard to actually consume. Okay, that there's not enough differentiation between the colors or between the boxes or whatever. Um, I pulled these at random from the internet. So it could very well be that they were actually just trying to point this thing out 
and that's why it's the only thing that's blue. So maybe there is a good reason for it. But in general, I think this is too, like almost too not marketing to really be understandable. <clears throat> Whereas you have one like this, which I think is much better, and I apologize for the vertical alignment, um, but it shows it's a technical architecture, and it shows you like protocols between the different things, you know, Postgres, right? It shows you how these things are working together, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But this is significantly more understandable, um, both to me and in my experience explaining it to other people. Uh, you know, irrelevant of whatever the hell you're doing. Um, does that make sense? Any questions about this? So what I'm hoping for in your presentations is, you know, something that's, you know, kind of both of those, right? So something that that, and if you do, at least in my opinion, if you do something that's closer to this, that might count for both, right? Um, that would be something to talk to me about first. Um, but I don't really want to make you do the work twice, but I want you to think about the different audiences that you're trying to communicate to. Uh, and so, therefore, how you might have to present things differently. Okay. And that was all my slides. Any other questions? All right. Uh, yeah. All right. So, why don't we do uh, kind of move back to teams um, and maybe show hands if you would like to come over and talk about anything in particular? Um, 